Um, okay, guys. So, um, so last week I went to the uh, the Efrat Library. Um, we have a good library, Baruch Hashem. Um, and I just uh, I just took out a pile of books on Agadata, just because I was like, look, I got you know, I probably should have done that at the beginning of the year. Probably should have done that at the beginning of the year, honestly. <laughs> right? See what other people say. Um, I had more fun this way. I think maybe next year I'll look more at other things. But I wanted to do it one year more myself. Um, I'll be honest that I was sort of disappointed with the books I took out. The books I would want to take out, if people are more impressed with, I will have to get. But the ones I got there weren't, weren't so great. Um, but I found one chapter that I did think was, well, it was interesting that related to our Perek. So, uh, so I figured I... What? No, no, this was interesting. This was, again, I don't necessarily... They didn't flesh it out nearly as much as it should have been fleshed out in this book. Um, but I think it's... Um, and that is the, the Gemaras of Antoninus and Rebbe. Ooh, that's good. Uh, we're, we're not. Yeah, we're so, it, it's a few places. So, let's start with Yudom and Aleph. Okay? So, so this is, a, is, this is an interesting Gemara. Let's start with where it says, Yom Ginusaya Shamal Chayhem. Okay, you got it? So one of the holidays that the Gemara discusses that, uh, you know, for our, the purposes of those holidays that are idolatrous, right, right. is Yom Genusia. And the Gemara says, My Yom Genusia, Shalom Right? You didn't have to ask me that. The Gemara says, What exactly is a Yom Genusia? That's not exactly a common word. Right? You know, Genusia. Right? If you get like the, uh, you know, like the one page dictionary of most common u- words using Gemara, Genusia is not there. So, Amr of Yehuda, Yom Sham, Midin Bavdin, Chachamim, Es Malkam. It's inauguration day. Right? Or the Vatanya Yom Genusia, of the Yom Shamidin, Bo, Es Malacha, Es Malkam. How could that be? Of a Brisa that says, the Yom Genusia and the day of inauguration? So, Lokash, Yahadi, Deha, Debrei said, no, one is the day in which the king becomes king, and the other one is the day in which the prince is becomes king. Uh-huh. Right, like a new king or a prince, uh, like and then the Gemara like says, "What? Kind of well, like Correct." A and then the Gemara says, "Mimuk me Malka bar Malka, Vatani Reb Yosef hinei kata nesatiha ba goyim shin mochim in Melech ben Melech, Bazer de Meoch in lelokzavolosh lashon." Right, so the Gemara challenges this. We don't do that. Elamai Yom Genusia. What is Yom Genusia? Yom Aleida. It's the birthday of the king. Uh, Yes, amongst the you know many rayas in the Gemara that birthdays are not a primarily Jewish thing. Um, there was a, a, a long article published on the uh, long, lo, long-ish by what? Zodiac. Written by um, by wait, come to me by Galinkin by 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 Professor uh, David David David. Whatever he's the head of the Schechter Institute, like the conservative movement branch in, in Israel. So he wrote an article on, uh, I think, in honor of his fiftieth birthday, someone else's fiftieth birthday. I'm not really sure I mean, on birthdays. And he he noted that there there is Jewish precedent to celebrating specific birthdays, right? Like there's a very old Jewish practice of celebrating your sixtieth birthday because the, since the Gemara says that kares means dying before sixty, so there was a Right. Uh, it's in the Gemara. Oh, it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, not the not the birthday, not not, not the birthday part of it, but the yeah. And then there are people who who oh, cel- okay, yeah. and then there were rabbanim who celebrated their seventieth birthday because since that's the normal lifespan of a person, uh-huh. right? You, right. So uh-huh. living more than seventy years is a, is it like a sudas huda? Okay. Right. Obviously bar mitzvah. Okay. Right. And then there were like post game who like on the eightieth, right? Because you know, like the decades where the Gemara sort of analyzes, right? The Mishnah says the the decades right. are important. So there were people who said like certain birthdays, but there's notion like a yearly birthday is not like. A, I mean, is anyways, I don't want to get into the that was a parenthetical point. I don't want to get into the birthday point. Yes. Now, uh, some random question: Is the conservative movement the big one? Was that uh, uh, oh, in Israel? No, not particularly. Um, in America, yes. In a number of ways, yes. Anyways, okay. Fine. So the... Um, right, so the Gemara, anyways, right, so the Gemara had said that the Romans don't actually put, right, sons of the of the king uh, uh, in the throne, so it can't be right. So the Gemara says, okay, it's the birthday. 
So the Gemara says, wait a second. Vatani Yom Genusia V Yom Alita. There's another writer that says Yom Genusia and birthday, which means it's not birthday. So Akasha Hadire No, it's the birthday of the king or the birthday of the prince. Vatanya Yom Genusia Shalo, Yom Genusia Shal Beno, Yom Alida Shalo, Yom Alida Shal Beno. Right? No, there's another price that says his and his son's Yom Genusia and his and his son's birthday. Right. And the my Yom Kinusia, so what is the Yom Kinusia? Yom Shamidim Vomalkam. It is inauguration day. Below Kasha, Hadi Dev Hadi Bray. What? V. Kasha, Lach Mulkmi Malka Bar Malka. Right? And then you'll say, oh, but don't they not ever have dynasties? And the says, no. Wait, wait, wait. That's not the problem. He says, right. He says, Al Yidei She'ela Mulkmi. So, no, no, no. They do have dynasties, but it's not automatic. Right? So that's not, isn't the question that, that Bryce uh, quotes both? Yeah, 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 so now he says, um, so he says, uh, one second. Okay, I can't even figure out the coronation question there, right? <laughs> okay. Um, but the Gemara's question now is not on the L- language issue. It's first on the Kashalak Luluk Mukme Malka Bar Malka. Right. Right. Don't they not have princes take over their fathers? The says, no, no, no. Well, they Sheila Mukme. Right. Meaning the the princes don't automatically become kings, but if they ask the officers, then they do. So that's like a side question. Right? Yes. Okay. But that's where our story comes up. Right. Kigon Asirus Asverus. In English, they put it as. As, I, I opened up the Koran to see what they, who this is. Asverus, son of Antoninus. Okay? Mm-hmm. Who, Bar Antoninus de Melech. And now the Gemara tells you an interesting story. So Amr, and this is where we meet. Amr le Antoninus le Rebbe. Antoninus said to Rebbe, Be'ina dimloch, Asverus bar Britachtoi. I want my son Asverus to be the king. Betis abe Tveria Kalanya. And I want to make... Tveria putter from paying taxes. Hmm. Okay? Oh, because we're everything. Yeah, something like that. The Emalu Chada Avdi Trelo Avde. If I say to my officers, to my advisors, do one of them, they'll do it. Right? I have political capital for one request. <laughs> but two, no. <laughs> so what am I supposed to do? <laughs> right? What am I supposed to do? <laughs> yes, inochinami. Wait, fine. Um, so Rabbi Yehuda Nasi responds to him in a in a riddle or a parable. I don't know what you want to define what's about to happen. I see gavra arkave achavre. So Rabbi Yehuda Nasi said, brings a person. He brings Yosef and he brings Danny and he puts Danny on Yosef's shoulders. V'yayv le yona li'iloi piyade and he gave a dove. To Danny, you're on his shoulders. Danny, into Danny. And then I told Yosef, tell Danny to let the dove go. Amar, so Antonino said, This is what he's telling me. Right? I will request from the from my officers to make Asverus king, and I'll tell Asverus that it part that his first legal, you know, his first act as king should be to make Tveria a tactic exempt place. What? Oh, you tell the bottom guy to. Uh... Why are you giving the dub? Ah, oh, he had a dub. The point is, he set him up with a dub. Right he said, uh... now, right now the right now the Gemara goes on. Right, right. Now the Gemara goes on this for uh, for a while, right? Of different advice that Yehuda Nasi would give Antoninus. We could read all of them, but I want to pick up on one imagery. Okay, I want you to keep that image in your head for a minute. Okay. Yeah. Now skip down to Yudam and Beis. Kolyoma, you see Kolyoma? Uh, Kolyoma. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Fine. Yeah, so, yeah. Kol Yom Avishadur Le Dahava Pricha B'Matarta V'Chitei Apumai. 
Wrong. No. Wrong place. <laughs> oh, I, found yeah, it, I found it. it. I found it. Right, so every day, Antoninus would send Rabbi Yehuda crushed gold in large sacks with wheat at the opening of the sack. Amrlehu, and he would say to his servants, Amtuchiti le Rebbe, bring this wheat to Rebbe. Amrle Rebbe lo tzarechna, and Rebbe said, I don't need gold. Right? Isli too, I have a lot. So Amrle havin le man de bartach, de avid le bartoi, de asu batrach, de asu minayu nefuk alayhu. So Antonino says the gold should be to your descendants who will give it to the last ones who come after you, etc., etc. And then you can pay the taxes that you need to pay to the Romans. Right, here's my... Wait, what's, the, what's this here? What's the, uh... He used to send Rebbe money. Rebbe tried to not take the money. Right, He would hide it in wheat. And then Antonino said, take it and you'll pay off the Roman taxes. Okay. Right, You have money now, but okay, it's my... But fine. So... Amr le... He would every day he had a tunnel that he would go to his house to do this Rebbe and he would bring students with him. A mighty tray avde chad katle abava debe Rebbe ve chad katle abava debe say. He would bring two servants every day and he would kill them both, one on the way in, one on the way out, so no one would ever know what he was doing. And he would tell Rebbe to make sure that no one's ever there. Right? He didn't want people to see what was going on. Right? Then obviously the story happens that it once happened. Right, that someone was there, but Chulei. So skip down. Another Koyoma. So Koyoma, right? So the Gemara sets this up that he used to, in secret, go to Rebbe. And what would he do? So Koyoma had a Mishamesh the Rebbe. Every day he would serve Rebbe. Machile, Mashkile, he would give him food, he would give him drink. Give a by Rebbe, Le Mesak Le Puraya. And when Rebbe would want to go to bed, have a Gochen Kami Puraya. He would lie down on the floor. And Amar Sak Ilavai Le Puraya, and say, Go on my back to climb into bed. Amar and Rebbe said, Like, I get it that you like me and you want to respect me, but you, you don't do that to a king. You don't humiliate a king that way. And Amar, He said, Oh, if only I were a mattress under you in the world to come. Right? Like, don't worry about it. And, uh... Um... So Amr Le, Asinu Al Modasi, a different time Antonin said, Am I going to the world to come? Right? What's the answer? Amr Le in? He said, Yep. Amr Le, Vaksiv Lo Yes, Sarid Le Vesi, Esav, Ba'usa, Maisa, Esav. He said, Oh, but doesn't it say in Ovadia that no one shall remain from base Esav and I am from Esav? Right? He says, Yeah, that's only the people who act like Esav, but not you. Tanya Nami Hachi, Lo Yes, Sarid Le Vesi, Esav, Yachal, Lo Kol, Tamil, Lo Vesi, Esav, Ba'usa, Maisa, Maisa, Esav. Okay? Good? Mm-hmm. Are we weirded out yet? Okay, good. Let's try one more story. Okay? Okay, go now to Yud Aleph Amid Beis. Guys, guys, guys. Go to Yud Aleph Amid Beis. Yeah. Yom Tiglach Tikno. Right at the top of the page. Another holiday was the day that he used to shave his beard. Okay. <laughs> Great. Skip down two lines from there. So Amar Yehuda Amar Shmuel, got that? Yeah. Mm-hmm. He says, There's a different holiday in Rome. Once every seventy years, Mivian Adam Shalem Umar Hoto Al Adam Chiger. They take a per, like a, a regular person and they put him on the shoulders of a someone who limps, right? A lame person. Malbishin Ozo Big Day Adam Arishon, and they dress him up in the clothes of Adam Arishon. Umanichan Lo Birosho Kar Kar Kiflo Shor Bishmal, and they put on him the skin that was scraped off the face of Rabbi Shmuel. They put on the mask of his actual skin. Uh-huh. Remember that story? The Sorry, Rabbi Malchus. They right. right peeled off the face of Rabbi Shmuel. You know. Yeah. Yeah. You remember this story? Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, the yeah, horrible the story? Kill yeah, the daughter wanted to see the beauty of Rabbi Shmuel, so she peeled, she had him peel off the actual yeah, 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 yeah. face. So they took that and they put it as a mask. So on. Yeah. Yes. Okay. No, no, not no. seriously. This, this is an Agatha. One second. I don't know. The Talule and they put it on his neck. Mitkalri Zuza de Pisa. Umechavin as a Shvik Shakim Inach. Umachrizin Lifonav. Sachkari Plester. Achva de Marno Zayafna de Chame Chame Udlo Chame Lo Chame Mayahani Lerama Biramuse Ula Zayfana Bizayfusne 
Umisaimin behachi vailadin kad yakum dein. You're like, what the heck did I just read? Right? Okay, I'll read you the English just quickly. Right? It's a, it is not an easy lo- passage to read. Okay? This is what it means. So, they would hang gold on his neck weighing 200 dinars, cover the markets with onyx. I don't know why. A announcement before him, the calculation of the master Jacob with regard to the time of the redemption is fraudulent. The brother of our master, i.e. of Esav, is a forger. They further announce one who witnesses this festival witnesses and whoever does not witness it will never witness it because it's once every 70 years, right? One chance per lifetime. What purpose does deceit serve for the deceiver and forgery for the forger? And they conclude in this fashion... Woe unto this one, Esav, when that one, Jacob, will arise, as this will cause Esav's downfall. Hmm. Um, Whack. What? That is whack. Yes. (laughs) One more, right? Not in Avodah Zarah, but is on the Pasuk of Shnei Goyim Bivitneich, right? Mm Mm-hmm. What, how do Chazal understand it? There's a Midrash. Shnei Goyim. How do they translate that? No, sorry, it is here. Yeah, no, no, it is here. Uh, it is on Daf. Uh, on second. Yudal, oh, Yudal, from Aleph. Vayomer la Shnei, Shnei Goyim bevitnech. Two nations in your womb. I'll just read it to you. Amar Yudam Arav. Al Tikri Goyim Ela Geim. Not nations, but what is Geim? Proud. Proud ones. Ze Antoninus Virebi. These are Antoninus and Rebbe, right? They are prefigured already. Right. That they always had vegetables, which was a sign of great wealth, right? Even in the winter. Right. Right? Having vegetables in the winter, this was great, great wealth. Right? That wilted salad, you know? Wealth! Wealth, people. Right, right. See what we do for you here in McDonald's. I'm joking. The salad is wonderful. It was a joke. It was a joke. <laughs> right. Okay. So now. So what? Get, get us out of here. Right. So let's. There are obviously oh, many, many so others. But what is going on in the Zagatatas? Yeah. Right. What is going on? So I want to try to. Right. Like I said, this I thought was an interesting analysis. And I want to. I want to analyze a few of the common themes. If you just took those Zagatic passages, what common themes do we see, and what can we analyze? So what themes come up? More than once. Uh, Rome sucks. Jews are awesome. Okay. Sure. Okay. Rome. Bad. Jews. Great. Good. What other, what other themes come up? Uh, Antonus, Antoninus, whatever, worship Rebbe. What? Antoninus really likes Good. Antoninus. He likes and... Respects. And... Gives to listen he to. is in certain sense subservient to yeah. Rebbe, right? Okay, to Rebbe. Okay, what other theme? Uh, Rebbe gives him advice. What? Sure. Well, that's probably all in this, right? It respects, whatever. What else? What are the themes? Yeah, right? Asa versus Yaakov. Good. Asa versus Yaakov. What else? What theme comes up at least twice? Uh, right, let's look at these and we'll start to build a pattern here. What about Asa versus Yaakov? Yaakov wins. No. Asa wins. No. They go up and down. Uh, when one's on top, one one's goes up, the other goes down. Right, right. There's never equal. Equal. never equal. Right, right. Where, so there's more than one time that this theme comes up. When did right, right? Don't just take my word for it. One is clearly the Last seventy-year one. holiday. Yeah. Right. Right. Right now, look at the Jews, the chiger, the the lame one, right, for deceiving Yaakov. But oi to the Romans when. Right, right. Oil is there, right? But where else? So where else is there a nice flip? Uh, oh, where he's uh, where he wants him to sit on his, uh, his back, stand on his back to get. Yeah, him. Antoninus is the actual king. So who is actually subservient? Rebbe. Rebbe. Who's acting subservient? Antoninus. Antoninus. 
right? Which means that there is a not a flip as much as both at the same time. Right. That in reality, Antoninus is king. King. In practice, he's right treating Rebbe with respect, but there's also another illusion of power going on here, which is uh, that it looks like Antoninus has power, but who actually has power? Rebbe. Mm, it, His Torah. Rebbe or Olam Abba. God. The officers. Officer. Remember? Oh, yes. He's afraid of... He looks like he's the emperor. Right, right. But he has to defer to the officers. And who gives Antinous power over the ro- officers? Rebbe. Rebbe. How? Because he asks him about uh, giving... About his son, I guess. Trickery. Mm-hmm. Right? Trickery. Remember? That thing that brought Yaakov on top of Aesop to begin with? Right, right. Right? Remember that? Right? Mm-hmm. Don't be fraudulent. This is what happens to fraudulent people. Right. Except Rebbe instructing Antoninus and in how to trick it. the officers is what gave Antoninus his power. Yeah. Right? Right? right. You, you, you sort of see there's some, some themes that might be hinting here. Now there's one more image that I want that, that is floating around in this story and then we can try to bring it back together that will bring in one more Yaakov Esav moment which is go to the 70 year one. Okay? The 70 year, what's going on in the 70 year story? But what story does that remind you of? Um, Yovel. No. Not a runaway. But Yovel can't get his face ripped off. Walking through the streets of the city declaring so wow. shall happen to the person. Ah, I'm in Mordecai. Yeah, good, good. Except it's a Pervert, it's a perversion of it. Right. Right? It's, right, Ace of, right, think about it, right? What's that story? That story is, right, Mordecai the Kaf. Jew on top of the Ace of figure, so to speak. Right. Right? Out of a sign of respect. And this time it's the Ace of on top of the Jew. Yeah. Right? But with the recognition that sometimes it, it can flip. Right? So this, whichever book is reading, right, pointed out that. There seems to be a sort of uh, what do I like, call it? Cyclical. Right. These agadot are taken together. Seem to be a rumination of the Gemara on the power dynamics, the nature of the biblical and historical power dynamics between Yaakov and Esav. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. So if we start the first one, right, like historically, right, the first one historically is Shnei Goyim Bivit Neich. Right? Now, Shnei Goyim Bivit Neich, the... At one level, it means Esav and Yaakov. Right? Now, Esav and Yaakov are like traditional enemies. But at another level, what does it mean for the Gemara? Rebbe and Antoninus. So the first thing the Gemara says is that the nature of this relationship is complicated. Right? right? Sometimes it manifests itself literally as Shnei Goyim Bivit Neich. Yaakov and Esav at loggerheads, and sometimes it manifests itself as them respecting as Rebbe and Antoninus as them being great together, right? Right. Where does the Gemara then build on that theme? Hmm. Antoninus's conversation with Rebbe. Rebbe, am I going to Alam Haba? Hmm. And Rebbe says yeah. yes, and he says how. Right. Ovadia says that Esav is doomed to hell, right? And what does he say? Only Ba'ose Masa Esav, meaning it doesn't need to be that way, right? There, throughout history, the Yaakov Esav story doesn't always manifest itself the same way. Sometimes it manifests itself in Ovadia esque, which is if the Esavs of the world act like Esav, then it's Yaakov versus Esav. But if the Esavs of the world don't act like Esav, <laughs> then it's Shnei Geim Bivit Neich, two proud nations that can work together, right. not two nations at loggerheads. Right? Sure. Then the Gemara continues and it says, right, the reality of their world was what? What's the reality of Chazal's world? That Rome was on top. The Rome's on top. Right? Chazal need to explain theologically how this works. Right? How do you grapple with it? Right? That's the point of a Gadotah, right? To teach people how to deal with things. Right? Theological lessons. So, 
they tell a story, right? Which is that even the Romans understand that what? Right? Right? The Romans understand that why are they on top? Because Because we're bad. We're the bad ones, not them. We're the frauds. Right? Right? But at the last minute, what do they recognize? The Jews are going to win. Well, not that they're going to win, right? The Romans at least recognize. They don't realize the Jews are going to win. But what do they realize? They're going to fall. Well, no. That there's a re- that it's not forever, <laughs> right? Meaning their perception that we're bad, right? I Meaning what? At the end of that Agatha calls into question the beginning, right? I Meaning the Romans are presenting it as if they will always be on top because we're evil and we deserve this. But at the end of the day, they admit that it's not eternal. Mm-hmm. Because when the Jews go up, they'll go down, which means that their original claim that we're evil and therefore deserve to be on the bottom forever is false. Is false right? The reality is that right? this is cyclical. Yes, if we do the wrong thing, we'll be on the bottom, but it's not forever because we're not flawed from the original moment. Right? Think about what they're putting in the Romans' mouth. Right? The Romans claim that fundamentally they're always above us. Because Yaakov sinned. But then they undercut themselves by saying, but it's possible the Jews will end up on top again. Right? Which is Chazal's subtle way of saying, don't think that this is the future forever. Right? That you're fundamentally flawed from the beginning. Recognize that this is historically contingent. How do they continue telling that story? Antoninos and Rebbe. They tell a story which, who knows, it probably didn't happen quite the way they tell it. Right? I would doubt it. But what's the story? Well, he'd be at a soldier is pretty quick. Right? <laughs> but what's the story? Right? What does the story tell us that, yeah, that the good people amongst yeah, Rome... Guys, what does it tell them that the good people amongst Rome recognize that what? Mm-hmm. That Yaakov mm-hmm. really is the one that's meant to be on top. Mm-hmm. Right? And that, there's a, and that, specifically by doing that, right? Meaning Antoninos is willing to lower himself. Yeah. Right? But by doing that, what does Himamela actually do? Raises himself. He raises himself. He makes it possible for them to both be together. For them to both make it into Olam Haba, right? Back to the Shnei Geim Bivitneich, right? Meaning, if Esau recognizes that we're not fundamentally flawed, right? Then by, right? The only way out of this cycle is for what? Is for mutual respect. Mm-hmm. If we're at loggerheads, right? Then only one of us can be on top. Yeah. But were Ace of to recognize that the Jews are fundamentally right, have the truth with them, then right, we could get on top. Or be equal. We could be equal. But the way that the Gemara it's not quite equal, right? What does the Gemara do? Right? It's instead of saying it's equal, what does the Gemara do? It paints a picture of a complex relationship. Right? Where it looks like Antonius is on top and at a certain level he is. But Yak but the Yaakov figure is sort of also on top, right? Meaning, it's not, right? Because think about it, even within that story, right? The part that I skipped, right? But we just saw the beginning of is one day he comes and someone's at Rebbe's and he yells at him, why do you let anyone be here? Meaning, right? Clearly he's sti- and Rebbe has to defend himself. Meaning, Rebbe's not actually on top, right? Right? That Antoninus is on top, right? Politically. Yeah. Right? Meaning there's a complicated, it's the story of not everything that right, meets the eye. And then the story of the officers, right, is saying that what, right? What does that story do? It redeems the 70-year story, right? The 70-year story is what? The Jews lied at the beginning. Yaakov lied at the beginning, and therefore they're damned forever. And what does this story tell you? No, a little bit of deception is sometimes necessary, right? And Dafka, it's the Yaakovness, right? The deceptiveness of Rebbe right. that allows... Antoninus to maintain his power, which is a total conceptual inversion of the story of Yaakov and Esau, but Mimela, it also acts as what? It's a sort of a subtle theological justification of saying, well, sometimes a bit of deception is necessary to do what's right. Right? right? But Mimela, if Antoninus accepts Yaakov, uh, Rebbe's deceptive advice to maintain his power, Mimela, he's providing justification for Yaakov, which provides theological justification for why Yaakov will one day rise, and this is a cyclical relationship rather than the Jews are always on the bottom. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. And there was this argument, I've developed a little bit more than this, the book I was reading, but what they claim, I think compellingly, is that at some level, right, 
I mean, I, the way I would put it a little bit is that the Jews can't speak too openly about Rome mm-hmm. is going to fall, right? Like, you can't just do that, right? You're amongst the Romans, right? There's been censorship for forever, right? But if you want to convey sort of a theological lesson and give people hope, right? The way you do it is you write a little bit in code, right? And I think these agaratotes sort of dance around this question by telling stories that remind us that the relationship that we have with Esau is not the way it always has been or needs to be, and things aren't always as they seem, and we have value, right? We're not downtrodden forever, right? Rome can have respect for us. We can coexist, right? And sometimes we might be on top, right? The way they tell that is by playing with these images, and I think the fact that it sort of plays with the with the Esther image is telling, right? Because that's like the... The not full. Exactly, right? That's what this book argued compellingly, is that that story, I think, right, I read it and I think Purim, right? Meaning it's the Vina Fochu. That story brings to mind the possibility of things not being as they are, right? Meaning invoking the Esther story is the is sort of Chazal's wink towards, you know, on a dime. It can go from Asaph being on top and the Jews facing destruction to Right, Mordechai being on top and Asaph having to show him honor. Right. But that's literally this all these messages are exactly what Purim is all about. Is that that eternal relationship and complexity of Asaph versus Yaakov, right, can change very quickly. It's not always one way or the other. It's not always as things change. Everything we've got a vocal and the Jews are sort of hinting to themselves um, that, that this can change too. Right? And again, I haven't fully worked out my thoughts on this paragraph, but I think the fact that there is a Right, a series of agarato flowing through the parak that is a rumination on what is the nature of power, right? What is the undertone? Are we really the underdogs, right? Or is there something else going on? Are there values beyond political power that make it that we're not really as downtrodden as we think we are? Is there hope, right? Chazal are sort of weaving these stories together to tell you, yes, there is. Yes, there's more to this story. Yes, there's another way this could be. Um, the last point I'll, I'll raise, which I think is one of the best... I don't know if I mentioned this agotic point to you before. I don't, even, I don't even know which academic first made this point, but I've heard it quoted by several people, um, which I think sort of fills out the picture. You know the Midrash that no one understands as because um, it just seems like overkill on when the Pasuk says that Esav returned from the Sadeh? Hmm. Right? Remember? All, like all the... Uh, he killed people... Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah, it says, he murdered and committed you know, Abu Dazara. He, right? And you look at it and you're like, why are you being so hard on Asaph? Right? So there was an academic who pointed out they're not being hard on Asaph at all. Right? What is it? It's the Jews talking about the Romans without saying it. Right? right? Because the average Roman officer on an average day, what did he do? He worshipped Avot de Zara, he raped Jewish women, and he killed Jews. What did they do? That is what they did. Right? right? That's literally what they did. Right? But you can't just say that. Right? You can't just come out and say, oh, you Roman officers. Right? You commit the three cardinal sins every day. Right? You can't say, you murderous pagan rapists. Right? But they were murderous pagan rapists. Right? Meaning... The point of this is, right, that many Agatatot about Esav, right, are Chazal's theological way of, you know, without being censored too much, talking about the difficulties they had with the Roman culture around them, Mm -hmm. right? And therefore, whenever you see these long extended Agata to talking about the nature of Rome or specific Romans, right, or stories or Esav, right, it's Chazal grappling with the reality of the Roman power around them and trying to talk about it theologically with a broader view of history and maybe a little bit of censorship, mm-hmm. right? And I think that's why you sometimes need to, right, for very practical reasons, right, read between the lines of what Chazal are saying on these because they were under, you know, they were often under Roman control when they were saying these things, right? So obviously you can't be too explicit Right. right, you have to hint at things, right, rather than just say them outright. You can't just say the Romans are going to fall because that's we're going to rebel, right. right? You can say maybe the Romans have a holiday and they, say, you know, and they invoke biblical psukim, which is so convoluted that by the time the person realizes what's going on, right, right, right. right? Okay, so again, th- this is sort of an initial thought about this. I haven't 
So I sort of have, you know, I haven't systematically gone through it, but I think it is undeniable that when you put these agatha together and you realize the imagery that comes up over and over, right? This is Chazal's attempt at providing theological language to sort of the political situation that they found themselves in. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Yeah.